page list, it's uh, accelerating. Uh, we can start the session now, Vishal, over to you. Sorry. Hi, uh, good afternoon, attendees. Uh, pleasure to have you here. Uh, welcome to the session on rebooting innovation, the upsurge of disruptive technologies amid COVID-19. Well, uh, we all understand that innovation is driven and in fact accelerated during crisis. The last real global crisis, according to me, and is obvious was World War II, right? When the most innovation really happened. But it wasn't truly global, was it? Because India was ruled by the British, uh, China was under Japanese control. We didn't see any innovation. We just sent our, uh, uh, our countrymen to go die in the war. But now in this current crisis, it is truly global. In fact, the pace of innovation through digital transformation is higher in Asia Pacific than in Europe and the US. In just a few months time, COVID-19 crisis has brought about years of change in the way companies and sectors in different regions do business. We all know this, we've been seeing it around our home. According to a new McKinsey Global Survey of Executives, their companies have accelerated the digital transformation of their customer, supply chain interactions and internal operations by three to four years. And the share of digitally enabled or new digital products has been accelerated by a whopping seven years. This kind of accelerated digital transformation is something that we've never seen before. And uh, we should be glad and fortunate to be experiencing this in our lifetime. I'm Vishal Reddy, your moderator for this show today. I'm an expert in immersive technologies, technologies that deliver immersion. And what is immersion? It is basically the need to be completely involved in a task. Uh, essential business tasks that are enriched by immersion is doing an action or a series of steps like procedural guidance, seeing or visualizing people, things, or environments uh, like product visualization, getting help and solving a problem, remote assistance. Iron Wowsum, founded in 2015, incubated by T-Hub, and now a global company having delivered over 5,000 immersive experiences. Now, following my introduction with great excitement, I introduce you to one of Wowsum's primary technology providers, PTC, the world's largest AR product company. Welcome Raj Kiran, uh, the India head for IoT and AR at PTC. Thank you very much, Vishal. Pleasure to be interacting with everybody uh, today. Um, I'm Senior Director for the IoT and AR business in India and South Asia. Um, and uh, IoT and AR is, is that kind of business, right? It's really catching on. And in adversity, like uh, Vishal said, uh, that's where technology is put to the best use. Uh, my background has been uh, with, with the large companies that you all know, uh, the names of Oracle, IBM, HP, Microsoft, et cetera. Uh, I've had different stints with all of these companies. Uh, and now, and, and I was familiar with working with databases, hardware, you know, enterprise software and so on with these companies. Now it is time to look at what the future holds for us. And the future is now. Uh, IoT and AR uh, is happening in the areas that Vishal talked about. AR is absolutely uh, prevalent and used uh, so widely, um, you know, immersive technology like it's called, uh, and reality has to be augmented uh, with digital data. And, uh, and that's what AR is about. IoT is about making the world smarter. So these are the two areas that I'm looking forward to engage with everybody uh, in. And uh, I'm, I'm involved even with the startup ecosystem with, uh, I do a little bit of investor uh, uh, activity as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be part of this. And thank you, t -Hub, for this uh, opportunity as well. Over thank to you, you Shesha. Hi all, my name is Shesha Ragnathan. I'm part of IBM Systems. I'm a senior and engineer. Um, I work in the area of hardware design, um, and I also am an IBM Distinguished Quantum Ambassador. Um, so I also uh, jointly work with IBM Research and Quantum Research in uh, India. Thanks, Shesha. Uh, you're among the very few people with these very niche uh, experience with quantum computing. I'm really looking forward to uh, having several arguments with you. Um, we also have Professor, uh, Professor Anil Prabhakar, 
uh, from the electronics department of IIT Madras. Anil? Uh, thanks, Vishal. Um, I am a faculty at IIT Madras and have been here for uh, about 20 years now. Um, I have had uh, my prior experience in industry for about five years working for Western Digital. And uh, now these days I work a lot on quantum technologies, quantum science. Um, it is a good convergence of uh, futuristic technologies that we are talking about today in terms of AR, IoT, and quantum. So I look forward to having interesting discussions on how that will pan out in our future. Yes, Anil, thank you. Uh, me too, I've never had a discussion with you know, a bunch of emerging technologies together, so I'm very, very excited. Uh, so as you see, uh, audiences, we have uh, uh, industry experts and an academician giving a perfect balance to this conversation today. Um, as a next step, uh, let me take this opportunity to give a quick introduction about T-Hub. Uh, well, T-Hub, uh, you know, leaving the official definition aside, it is amongst the most prolific startup ecosystems in the country, probably in the world. Um, it, it needs no further introduction, so I thought it's best to narrate my personal story with T-Hub, uh, and likewise the other participants will as well, uh, which, uh, which will give you the most sense out of uh, this conversation. Uh, Vausam was uh, founded in 2015, and it was one of the first uh, incubated companies in T-Hubs. It was the first successful incubation in T-Hub Lab 32 program in 2016. Uh, in one year, 2017, the company raised uh, their first uh, investment round and successfully graduated from that, uh, from that incubation program. So this is my history with T-Hub. Uh, uh, while leaving, uh, the company also leveraged on several uh, relationships with international trade organizations that T-Hub holds, and because of which, uh, today we are a global company. Uh, and I thank T-Hub for providing us the platform in the past and preparing us for uh, uh, to face the world uh, in many sense. And I urge each one of you to explore and exploit the amazing access that TIA provides for research and development of your products and services, including intelligence and access for market release as well. Uh, that's what TIA has mean to me. And uh, uh, Shesha, so what is your story with TIA? So I got to know about TIA uh, probably a year, year and a half back. Um, I did one session, internal session with TIA group uh, a few months back, uh, but before that, I got to know through news articles and such. Based in Hyderabad, um, there is a lot of dynamism uh, as I see it, and the, uh, and uh, whatever. I haven't physically visited the place, but I've seen, uh, seen some videos of it. Uh, looks like it's a nice environment uh, for uh, uh, startup ecosystem and for innovation in general. Uh, the platform seems nice. Uh, hopefully, I want to see more um, deep tech kind of innovation coming through as well. Uh, in this platform, hope uh, to see uh, more nanotechnology, deep tech uh, in that space as well coming through. Um, and uh, my best wishes to T-Hub and the team uh, for more of these activity and bringing folks like us on this platform, talking about these technology, hopefully we'll see more ideas and discussions uh, that will lead to more uh, inter interesting uh, uh, discussions ahead. Thank you. Certainly, Shesha. So uh, when my company was selected in 2015, uh, it was deep tech and it was emerging, right? So, and today they're working with you in quantum computing. So I'm sure they have a lookout for deep tech companies. And that's really amazing and encouraging in a place like Hyderabad. Uh, the campus is beautiful amongst the best places to work because it's in it's within a university, triple IT. Uh, so typically there's lots of space, lots of trees around the building and giving you that very uh, you know, cozy environment. Uh, I love my time in Bihar. Thanks for narrating that. Um, Anil, uh, what is your story with T-Hub? Well, I haven't actually officially interacted with T-Hub except for having uh, had conversations about how do we bring on training platforms around the quantum environment to T-Hub. Okay. So that was a conversation I was actually having with the Telangana government mm -hmm. uh, before the pandemic. So we are hopeful that uh, in a few months or so, we should be able to restart some of those conversations. Um, and with Sesha also on board, I think that might be a good uh, initiative to look up. Absolutely. Uh, and all, uh, both of you are already working together. Uh, yeah. I wish you the best uh, for that conversation, Anil. So uh, uh, last, Raj, uh, I guess you've heard about t -Hub through this, uh, but what is your opinion? Yeah, I've heard about uh, T-Hub uh, very recently, of course, but 
I know of the importance of uh, similar such aggregator, you know, platforms of networks, right? Uh, that brings together uh, different types of companies and different areas of technology. Uh, um, IoT, for example, the field that I'm in is so, uh, it is so necessary to have different types of companies come together. It's a coming together of various different technologies, hardware, software, services, AI, ML, uh, you know, sensors, IT, you know, all of that together. So a platform like T-Hubs is extremely vital to fostering technology. Uh, and I think that's, that's extremely important to make sure that the right ecosystem, the right partners come together, like-minded uh, individuals, starting off companies, uh, seeking funding, all of that comes together. And therefore, it's important. I've been associated with a couple of them in the past. I've, I've seen the work that NASCOM has done as well. Uh, but I think this is, this is vital. So all the best, you have uh, in future as well. And I look forward to further associating with you. Thanks for that, Raj. Uh, yes, you're right. When I entered T-Hub, I was bootstrapping the company and it was my first technology business. Uh, the ecosystem provided everything I needed. Um, yeah, uh, anyway, I think we have we've been uh, quite polite to our host and given them enough exposure. Let's get into the main conversation. It was just really enjoyable doing that. Um, Allow me to set the intention for the main panel discussion uh, for which all of you are here for. On the panel, as you can see, we have experts from the emerging fields of quantum computing, IoT and immersive technologies, which is AR, VR, MR and AI. Well, quantum computing is surely an emerging field, but in relation, uh, IoT and AR are more established and proven technologies. But nevertheless, for the sake of this conversation, let's put all of them into the same bucket. To begin with, uh, we will define the technologies, uh, discuss the current insights on where the market is, both global and India, following which we'll discuss the challenges and opportunities that these sectors, these fields present. Next, uh, we'll spend some time describing our idealistic vision for the adoption of these technologies. Each of us have our ideal vision, our dream vision. Uh, we'll have some fun sharing that. Obviously, the vision of the future, of course. Um, Next, we'll see how these technologies transform our lives uh, for human beings as individuals, how they make our world a better place and how they greatly improve the quality of our lives. Um, towards the end of the panel discussion, we would like to give our expert advice, our opinions to various groups uh, of attendees, namely the investors, uh, the entrepreneurs, businesses, all, all of whom are essential groups of this ecosystem that are essential and required for adoption of any emerging technology. So that will be the flow of the panel discussion. Um, and let's begin. So uh, initiating the panel discussion, I think it's fair to begin with quantum computing, uh, the most current and emerging technology. Uh, I have done a bit of reading, but you know, really I could, you know, Shesha, you could consider me as a novice in the field. Um, uh, I understand very little about quantum computing and I'm looking forward to learning about it and also seeing how I can apply uh, and collaborate with quantum computing in my field, which is immersive tech. So Shesha, from a very basic level uh, to our audiences, what is quantum computing and what are its applications? So quantum computing is a fundamentally different module of compute. Um, the way we do our compute these days in hardware, we do it based on the bits, zeros and ones. And um, at that fundamental level, um, it is different. Uh, it's fundamentally probabilistic in that you can be in a, a combination of zero and one in a probabilistic sense. Uh, it works on top of the basic principles or postulates of quantum mechanics. So it runs on top of quantum principles and the computation is done using the quantum principles. There are certain unique quantum phenomena like quantum entanglement and superposition uh, which are not seen in the regular classical world. And the reason for the interest in quantum computing as a technology is leveraging on those fundamental quantum principles uh, that gives us that unique exponential state space that is, uh, that is there. Um, so, that, so the question then is, what can it do well? And does it do everything well? Is it a panacea? It certainly is not. Um, it can do some problems well, there are some proven problems that 
uh, it has shown better performance compared to classical. Let's say the factory example that you quoted earlier, uh, there is no known, no known efficient classical algorithm that can break, that can do the factoring efficiently. So quantum can do that efficiently. By efficiently, it means in polynomial time. Uh, a technical jargon there, but nonetheless, think of it as a finite time. It can do it in some reasonable finite time. Um, so similarly, there are a few other results that shows that there is something fundamentally different. Um, there is something unique that it brings to the table that the classical cannot do it uh, as a matter of principle. You cannot do it, right? So you can even think of it as a complexity argument. So it cannot solve certain things efficiently that quantum can. So for example, if you want to simulate a molecule, uh, a, a reasonable size molecule, you cannot do that classically because if you want to do that simulation correctly, you have exponential state space to track. And by the time your memory explodes, you just cannot do it practically. So you will have to cut down on it. Uh, another classical example is say drug. Uh, recently in the pandemic, say if you want to find a new drug, um, and you have a new virus like the corona thing that we ran into through this year. The challenge these days is how do I identify that molecule that will go stick onto that virus and not the others so that there are no side effects and other things. In order for us to do that, you should be able to simulate this. And we cannot simulate this efficiently using the classical hardware. And therefore you're, you have to rely on heuristics and after which you have to actually do clinical trials to validate things, build those and things. And that's where um, uh, I think quantum provides a, a unique value proposition. Uh, in terms of uh, its potential impact, uh, remember um, how uh, GPUs impacted uh, in the last decade. Uh, the emergence of GPU brought in AI in a big way. Uh, AI uh, was, uh, was in a slumber for a while, but with the GPUs coming in in the last 10, 15 years in particular, what we have seen is the revolution that it caused is because of that capability to do certain processing more efficiently, transformed the whole landscape of uh, how we do things. Uh, we see quantum has similar capabilities. In fact, uh, I see personally as it's a GPU with steroids in a more computational sense, and it can do a lot more things um, efficiently on certain kind of problems. As I described, uh, certain things it can do well. Um, and so uh, it opens up new avenues and it's, it's an expanding avenue with active areas of research going on with new problems being studied. Shisha, may I ask this? So uh, there are two parts to this. One is problems that cannot be solved uh, with current approach, the principle, and the second category problems that can be solved faster by using quantum computing. Can you give an example, like one example for each? So one was that molecular simulation that you cannot solve, right? Okay. Uh, that you cannot do uh, because just a exponential, the state space argument, you, yeah. it just grows exponential. You just cannot do it efficiently. If you want to do it accurately, you can do only approximations and heuristics. Mm -hmm. So that's one example where you cannot do things. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing where it can do better or differently is um, uh, think of uh, quantum is fundamentally random, right? In, in the sense, if you want to see probabilistic, you can do say, random number generation more efficiently. I mean, it's something very fundamental, unique to it. Yeah. Um, so can we do a better random number generation using quantum? It's a very simple idea, right? There are a lot of work that is already there. It's, it's not something that is earth shattering in, in terms of concept. But as a simple example, um, even with uh, the random number generators that we have classically is not super bad. It's just that now you have something that is at a very fundamental level uh, random. You can leverage something fundamentally random in, in, from quantum physics to leverage and do something better. So then the question is, can it do a different, can you do a, provide a better result? And that can have consequence um, uh, into different applications and different domains, uh, something as simple as that. Or alternatively, a uh, little bit more complicated ones are, you can have heuristics in quantum too. It's not that it's going to solve exactly everything. I mean, you can have heuristic algorithms much like the way we have heuristic algorithms in uh, classical. So can we do, say, prediction better? Um, because I have this exponential state space, somehow I encode my uh, information in this uh, complex exponential state space. Can a uh, quantum algorithm explore the uh, exponential state space in a different way and do a prediction better uh, in the AI space, for example? So that's a quality of results argument. That's not a runtime argument here.
Um, what is one example that most uh, like a common person would know, like a successful example in quantum computing? Um, I wouldn't say successful per se because it's not product yet. It's, it's in our development. Okay. Popular ones um, are the ones that are more um, popularly known is in the space of healthcare and the drug that I described because uh, that's more that's impacts everybody. You don't need to be an engineer to talk about drugs, right? Uh, if I talk about AI, ML, and prediction and such, you, you need to have some relative background. So in, in a broader sense, healthcare problems in healthcare and life sciences um, are the ones that are probably more interesting for wider audience, uh, given that it impacts every person directly uh, so, in, in a more direct way. So the accelerated pace of developing these vaccines wouldn't have been possible without quantum computing. No, yes. we don't have quantum computing at scale right now for us to use and solve that problem. I Had see. it been there, uh, it would have helped significantly. Uh, as you know, through last year, uh, many supercomputers were used to do a lot of simulations uh, to do drug discovery um, as part of that. Even in IBM, IBM Summit, which is the biggest supercomputer we have, was used for some of those simulations. Okay. So, But then there are fundamental limitations to classical compute. And that's what I mean. If we had quantum computer at scale and was uh, uh, reasonably good, which, is, which currently it is not, um, it would have helped quite a bit in that journey. I understand. So quantum computing can be used to play better chess compared to uh, computer? <laughs> I think AlphaGo has done a pretty good job already, right? In terms of uh, doing some of those things efficiently. So uh, I think uh, the the other one, the multi-dimension thing, which is more harder uh, uh, game, I guess. Uh, so I think the challenge has moved to a different game. Chess was the go-to thing in 90s and 2000s. Yes. Now it's... Uh, the other game which has become more harder to solve uh, so then maybe we want to see whether can it solve mm -hmm. that problem better uh, uh, so yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that soon uh, so extending this conversation uh, uh, professor anil um, so quantum computing cannot solve the simplest problems uh, the most obvious problems like two plus two is to four right um, and shesha has given some examples of uh, the predictive uh, the uh, predictive analysis that it can do, the projection that it can do. So what is your opinion on this? What do you think is the ideal model to apply quantum computing uh, for experiments and for the industry? You know, we use the words quantum computing very uh, generally. Uh, I like to think of them more as application-specific quantum computers today. Uh, there are different types of hardware uh, uh, I mean, what Shesha is talking about is one type of hardware that IBM has. Uh, there are other types of hardware that other companies have made, uh, for example, Honeywell. Uh, and uh, what you would see is that they each have their own benefits. So if you look at a particular kind of hardware, you might be able to solve a problem on that hardware faster or better than if you tried it uh, on either a classical computer or on a competing quantum hardware. Uh, so in that sense, I think one has to be very application specific. Uh, there are uh, some uh, problems that are of immense in interest to industry. I know Airbus has a challenge out on its 3D bin packing problem. How do you fill a uh, cargo airplane uh, with uh, uh, crates of different sizes? Yeah. Um, and that's a problem that uh, uh, you know people are trying to solve on a quantum computer. We can do it, a 2D bin packing problem relatively easily on a quantum computer, but uh, 3D is still uh, uh, needs some more work, right? So there are, uh, the other example is a routing problem. I mean, you know, you have a limited shortage of vaccines. How do you optimize it? How do you send it? Where do you do all that? Mm -hmm. Those are all uh, fall under these classic uh, class of problems called NP hard problems. And you could pick any NP hard problem and start asking the question, can you build an algorithm for a quantum computer uh, that can do that better than a classical computer. Now, again, one has to be cautious when you say better, because if you pick a very small problem, then I can do it on my calculator, yeah. right? So the problem has to have sufficient complexity that you start hitting the limits of what is possible on a classical computer. And that's where you reach these holy grail types of uh, quantum supremacy, where you are showing that you can demonstrate do something on a quantum computer that you cannot do on today's best classical computers. Um, and I think there have been some early demonstrations of that from Google and uh, from the Chinese. Mm -hmm. 
they haven't solved any practical problem yet but i think the practical problems are maybe 2 3 years away um and so right now we are in this phase of ramp up where we think that uh, you know if we start working hard on training ourselves uh, we will be able to have access to the kind of hardware we need to solve uh, problems of uh, relevance to a relevant scale to industry all right i understand um so uh, let me uh, start a parallel thread here and bring in immersive technologies uh, from my perspective and raj's perspective so uh, like i defined earlier immersion is the need to be completely involved in a task traditionally immersion was delivered uh, by bringing people to specialized environments specialized built places like you come to an office to work um you come to a factory to you know work on the manufacturing line you come to a convention center um to experience an event or a conference or network now since the onset of the global pandemic it's become obvious but uh, i'm in a situation where i told you so since the last 5 years where this immersion needs to be delivered remotely and by delivering immersion we mean you have to make the experience as realistic engaging and satisfying on all our devices yeah and the best immersive experiences today are made with augmented reality where you project digital information on top of an object or a person uh, instagram facial filters are augmented reality uh, step by step instructions on a machine is augmented reality virtual reality where you are making a digital copy of a physical person object or an environment so that people can experience in a virtual world with different rules of physics and learn things third is mixed reality where you take this digital copy and place it in a physical environment to be able to visualize so uh, i want to buy a car i can't go to a showroom uh, i can download an application of the car uh, place it in life size in my garage and see and take a purchase decision so that's mixed reality now it is never one thing uh, like anil just pointed out it is a combination of technologies that deliver both complementary and supplementary technologies that deliver immersion now uh, immersive technologies mainly uh, referred to as ar augmented reality uh, started emerging in early 2010 11 in 2014 was when apple and companies like ptc have acquired ar engines uh, from some startups and gotten into the space today in 2020 2021 uh, the products are reliable credible and established and have delivered enough value across applications uh the top industries i would say are retail uh manufacturing and now more and more healthcare yeah because uh um, healthcare especially let me explain an example uh new vaccines new products are coming every other week uh and the ability to train the employees on the, on manufacturing these new products typically is done through classroom training experts coming into space and doing it is not sustainable anymore augmented reality pro, uh, procedures give step by step guidance in 3d in a physical environment sort of telling them exactly what to do in a real space uh, eliminating the uh, uh, eliminating the risk and improving productivity in these environments so that's what immersive technology is it covers augmented reality virtual reality and iot of course iot is an integral part of Uh, immersive technology because it basically ensures that machines talk to you in these immersive experiences by giving their data and their statuses through dashboards. Uh, Raj, you may have a few comments to add, uh, especially from the IoT perspective. I think you uh, you gave the overview pretty well, Vishal. I think uh, uh, majorly uh, immersive technologies are to make sure that humans learn better, experience better. and visualize things so that they understand better right so it's used in training servicing uh change over procedures within within manufacturing um uh, you know pharma uh, scenarios etc but also to operate very complex equipment uh that's where immersive technology augmented reality comes into play where uh, people standing in front of a complex machine no matter how many paper manuals they read in the past uh when they are told exactly what to do with augmented instructions in front of a machine yeah uh that helps them understand that much faster the cognitive dissonance which is there of reading paper and then relating that to what they see in front of them 
is completely eliminated. So they see the they see the machine and they know exactly what to do with it. Yeah. Now, how does the backhaul? Obviously, five G and communication technology improvement uh, is to help the fact that data needs to be rendered at a rapid pace. But quantum computing comes in right there. Exponential improvements in uh, volumes of data and the way data can be presented, uh, uh, you know, at at the speed of thought. Uh, that is what this can bring, and how it augments uh, whatever AR experiences can be generated. And on the IoT side, which Vishal mentioned, is a complement of AR. Uh, IoT side as well. You know, when machines, uh, connected products, for example, are out in the field and they need to be communicating uh, to the central platform or do edge computations with large amounts of data, uh, there itself, uh, they can, you know, with quantum computing, there can be leaps uh, in, in the processing power. And also validation and verification of those machines when they need to be authenticated to come into the network. Uh, and therein comes the security uh, quantum cryptography and all of that. I'm a novice, but I've read of all these terms uh, uh, as well. So all of these play in scenarios like that. So tremendous boost, like I said, various different technologies, each of them advancing in their own spheres, actually synergize together to make sure that the end customer experience is significantly enhanced uh, with all of this. That's my perspective. I agree. So that the end customer can focus uh, and be immersed in what they're doing rather than trying to figure out, you know, uh, the steps or refer to the procedure, et cetera. Everything is there in one view, right? Um, There's a relevant question, Raj, uh, from Syed Anwarullah. I can't see the full name, sorry, in Zoom. Can you give some interesting use cases where, uh, in PTC, of course, that combines AR with IoT? Sure, sure. Uh, I'm... Uh... All right, uh, combining AR with IoT, um, you imagine you want to service a machine. So there's a service technician on the factory shop floor that goes in front of a complex machine. Let's say it's a, uh, the example I can think of is an air and gas handling equipment, a large compressor uh, in front of somebody. Now that machine is actually connected to the IoT platform where the different parameters, the different vital statistics of it is being checked uh, or monitored. And uh, with, the, with the power of predictive maintenance, you can actually look at which of those factors going below, which of those parameters going below a certain threshold or above a certain threshold, as the case may be, is going to eventually cause a failure sometime in the future. Now, therefore, there can be an alert sent out when the person is going in front of that machine with a HoloLens or a realware device uh, a worn. Now, let's assume it failed. Okay, so this is the alerts that you can see when you look at the machine, that's step one. Uh, uh, a step further is let's assume that's failed because of a certain factor. Now he has to fix that equipment in front of him. Uh, he doesn't know how to do it in general or he has to go searching for his manual. Now, the customer care department of that machine can actually render an experience for him to look at that machine in front of him and tell him which knob to turn or what bolt to open up, which section of that machine to open up and what to fix. It could be a very simple fix, really. You know, a majority of fixes are very simple, just that people don't venture out to do it because they are scared of damaging the machine. So if he's told with instructions that this is what to do, then he can get that information right there. He can fix it himself. That's called customer self-service. So the power of IoT and AR combined together is tremendous. Physical into digital conversion is what IoT does. Digital into physical conversion is what AR does. So very complementary as technologies. Thanks, Raj. So basically, IoT provides the digital information in the augmented reality visualization, right? And like you said, once the alert pops up, I'm walking to the factory, alert pops up, I click on that alert, it'll give me the step-by-step -step procedure to troubleshoot in augmented reality, which is foolproof. Beyond that, um, if I'm still not able to solve the problem, then I do a remote assistance call where the expert can log in from home and draw in my environment because there's AR, it can detect the environment. I can doodle in it and show what to do exactly. So 
you know, 99% of problems are solved immediately on the job uh, using the combination of AR and IoT. Awesome. Um, I hope that gives you a reasonable insight into what this field is, immersive technologies, AR, IoT, et cetera. Uh, Shesha and Anil had described quantum computing uh, as well and their experience with it. Let's talk about what are the challenges uh, in this field. Um, who would like to take it on? Um, Anil, maybe, or Shesha, both of you, what are the challenges uh, that you see on a day-to-day -day basis because you are in the core of the emerging phase of the field, right? There's a lot of excitement, but what do you need next? Um, I think uh, what would really help is if somebody cracks a difficult problem, right? Proof of principle. I think the first time someone does that, uh, mm -hmm. and I think we are getting very close to that point, the tipping point where we will suddenly uh, start seeing a flood of applications. Yeah. Um, so that uh, I think uh, we are maybe about a year, two years away from. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so while we are preparing for that tipping point, uh, it's almost uh, self prophecy that we will reach that point because there's enough money and enough people looking at the problem. Um, now it's a question of, are we ready? Are we going to be ready when that tipping point comes to throw our uh, forces behind it? We don't want to be caught sleeping. So in some sense, there has to be self-belief also, right? That it is going to come and then we are ready to grab the opportunity. Now it would be, of course, fantastic if a startup from T-Hub were to tip the scale, then that would just be un uh, extremely good for the entire ecosystem. But even if we are not ready to tip the scale, we should be ready to seize on every opportunity uh, that is going to come our way uh, soon thereafter. I just want to add that, uh, you know, one of the things about IoT is the massive amounts of data it is going to generate. Yes. And that is where uh, the quantum computing also uh, comes in because uh, some of the algorithms have to do with how do you handle large data sets and quantum machine learning is tackling uh, ways and means of building better, uh, more efficient uh, neural networks to handle data analysis. So one could uh, you know, see a convergence of that happening also. And I think uh, we need to be ready for that uh, uh, as soon as Shesha gives me a working quantum computer. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, so there's a lot of prediction uh, apart from the data visualization, just detecting the environment and objects, you know, the efficiency can... Yeah. Because there's edge detection everywhere. Whether right. it's a shadow or an edge or a color, I can't imagine the possibilities of applying quantum computing in, in AR. Yeah. Of course, uh, towards the end, closing statements, I, you know, uh, I wanted to be a surprise. We'll discuss the integration of all these technologies. Yeah? All right. uh, Shesha, so uh, uh, challenges, uh, innovation, investment, uh, not enough entrepreneurs. What are you facing, uh, you know, penetrating this into the market? So, um... There are different layers, so hopefully um, you know, people uh, will be able to follow that layered uh, thing that I'm going to say. Um, and there is also uh, an, an orthogonal vector of global versus India. Uh, there is that differentiation too. Uh, so the layers part. Uh, one is building the hardware is darn hard. Uh, it's not a straightforward thing. Um, so the, uh, the progress that we have seen in the last uh, few years, uh, uh, is nothing short of a miracle in terms of the amount of scientific and engineering progress that has gone to build the hardware um, to the stage that it is in currently. Uh, it's not an easy thing. Uh, just as a, uh, just to give you a context, uh, the superconducting technology, superconducting qubit technology that IBM uses, for example, um, the, the qubits operate at about 10 to 15 millikelvins. Uh, that is something like 100 oh. times colder than outer space. Yeah. That is near absolute zero, right? Having, uh, and you had to do that because the quantum uh, effects uh, are very, very, very quirky things. They are very sensitive to noise. Even a random photon coming through can upset it. And that's why you have to operate at that temperature, isolate it completely so that it can uh, keep that quantum effect that much longer. And that's one of the reasons why we don't see any quantum effects in our real world. It dies around very, 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 very rapidly. Um, in order to keep that alive, the technology that has gone behind to make that happen to the stage we are in is itself a fantastic achievement, in my opinion, the scientific and engineering. And the progress that it needs to make uh, as such, we don't see a significant roadblock, uh, but it's not an easy path ahead either. It's a very hard thing to do. Uh, 
So first statement is on the hardware. That is the bedrock of everything that we can do, right? So it's not very easy, but yeah. we don't see a serious overflow. There is a lot of challenges in terms of doing it. And there is a lot of scientific and engineering work that needs to go to make it happen, to push the technology further along. Hardware, that was one. Next is uh, for foreseeable future, uh, till uh, we have very high quality qubits that we have, we have to deal with the noisy device that we currently have. So the challenge to the next layer is, how do I leverage the noisy hardware efficiently? It's a hard, in and of itself is not an easy problem. Um, so that becomes, a, think of it as a compiler problem, right? Yeah. So something on, at that level. Then comes the next layer. So is the application problem, right? So which is a good set of application that can leverage the hardware? So uh, Anil talked about application specific quantum computing, right, in a way. Uh, so what are those applications that can benefit from this hardware and what are those problems? And not all of them will work immediately. You can get some uh, interesting results in quantum, even, even you may prove it. For example, the factoring algorithm that you are referring to, it's a mathematically proven thing. However, for us to implement that algorithm in quantum hardware today, we cannot do it because the quality of hardware is not there. It's probably going to take a few years before we can get to that stage to be able to run that algorithm at scale. Today, they do factoring of 15 or something, something to show that it works, but we cannot do something at scale. So then the question is, what is that problem that can uh, benefit the hardware as it evolves? And so is it going to be a drug kind of a simulation model or is it going to be something else? That is one challenge. So that is on the technical side of things, right? On the other side, is the business side, right? It comes to, so this is an evolving technology. We can certainly see it is fundamentally different and disruptive, potentially disruptive technology. Um, so, um, and this is where the differentiation between global and Indian can potentially come in, in terms of investment. Um, because uh, the startup ecosystem, um, given that this is T-Hub, maybe I'll refer to that. Um, if you look at uh, OECD countries, particularly uh, US and uh, Western Europe, uh, there is a lot of investment and a lot of startups in this space. Um, the startups are either targeted towards doing things efficiently in hardware that is looking downwards or looking at different applications that is looking outwards towards the application, right? So those are the kind of uh, companies that have come. Um, more likely companies that are betting on uh, things that are bio, like simulation and those kind of things like uh, protein and those drugs and some offshoot of those are more likely to see some value in the shorter term. Um, things that are betting on uh, some advanced capabilities uh, that requires much more efficient hardware may come as a second wave of development or a second or a third wave downstream. Um, so, but then there is uh, investment happening on the startup. Uh, and if you see over the last five to six years, the investment um, has picked up quite a bit. Uh, uh, it stands around uh, uh, just the startup from one data that I saw uh, in 2020 star is around 375 million or something with uh, uh, 37 to 40 uh, uh, investments that have happened. Um, it has dropped from the previous year, but that fluctuation will be there. Uh, within the margin, but the general trend is moving upwards. Uh, that's in the global, mostly global. Um, by global, it's mostly US, Canada, uh, Western Europe. Uh, in Indian context, um, uh, I think there are some startups that are come here, but we, we need to do a lot more. Uh, I think in the Indian context, there is, uh, this is a, a different kind of a deep tech in, 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 in the sense that uh, it deep tech there are different challenges, like yours is a deep tech in a different way. It's a technology in terms of figuring out things in a different way. Here it is a slightly different kind of a deep tech, if you see what I'm saying. Um, but then there are opportunities too. So you need uh, that. So that this is an India challenge uh, in terms of bringing that. The other challenge is uh, US in particular, um, the academia and industry are much more tight uh, in terms of collaboration. Uh, at least my personal view. Um, there, 
uh, the research that happens in academia and the funding from the industry into the academia, and then researching on problems that academy. There is a lot more dynamism there. Uh, I think that will help a lot in this particular space specifically. Given the skill set that you need, the specialized skills that you need, uh, that will not generally be available in industry uh, broadly. You need to leverage academia uh, for that kind of skills. But that dynamism becomes very, very important. And I think that's something that we could do more on, uh, that building that dynamism uh, that is available, say, in the U.S. context. It's more natural there. It just happens seamlessly. Um, so here, that that's another challenge I see. And generally, the uh, funding within the academia also is another uh, thing. Uh, yes, Shesha. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, so uh, our company, Wowson, so a lot of our R&D uh, is funded by winning grants in the US and the UK. And I love that ecosystem because grant insists that you use uh, academic, uh, academic uh, partnerships. We have professors and talent from the university investing their time and effort in creating products. Um, I last I heard from T Hub, the system exists, but most of us are not aware. I think uh, you know uh, T Hub should uh, bring us all the uh, the competitions or you know the mediums that are available by the state and the central government and help us with these. I see you're already collaborating with Anil, uh, you know, uh, and working on projects. The main thing in this is funding, yeah. Whether it's a uh, grant funding for R and D or investor funding. Um, it is apparent that our future will be better by implementing these technologies. So talking about the future, um, let me describe the ideal future with immersive technologies in our lives. So today, we are constantly challenged with the choice of whether to have a real interaction or a digital interaction. We have our phones in our hand. Half the time we're talking to each other, we're looking at the phone. So a world with complete implementation of immersive technologies will merge both these realities, the physical and the digital. All the information I want is projected in context of the physical environment. If I'm looking at a person's face, their Facebook profile and the various variables that I need are projected in my vision. Yeah? When I'm talking to a machine and I'm operating my microwave, I want the instructions to be projected based on the time of the day, what I'm cooking, so that I can use my mind for bigger, better things rather than the menial tasks. Yeah. Uh, there are several projections by Microsoft. There's an episode by in Black Mirror by Netflix where they're wearing contact lenses. Basically, the headsets have become so small that your entire life is projected in front of you. Yeah. So that is the ideal vision for the future. Uh, it is already possible today with SDKs by companies like PTC. They have the world's highest penetrated uh, AR SDK called Vuforia. You can install Vuforia in any mobile app and deliver all these experiences. Yeah, object scanning, ground scanning, and the entire environment scanning. And I, after today's meeting, uh, we will push PTC to include quantum computing to enhance the performance even better. I'm looking forward to that. So uh, uh, Anil or Seisha, uh, what is your ideal vision? Very quickly in 30 seconds, what does the life of quantum computing feel like? Is it even possible to define today? Uh, Anil, uh, either of you, I'm sorry, uh, Seisha, Anil, since you guys work together, you must have had these conversations. So, um, quantum computing, unfortunately, is very nerdy. <laughs> you, you guys can give reference to some nice Netflix <laughs> documents and uh, say this is what it looks like. I unfortunately yeah. cannot find that kind of so, anything other than some so, documentary or something. So can uh, but quantum computing provide the answer to the meaning of life. <laughs> <laughs> so then it goes into philosophy, right? That also. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, uh, joke aside, I think um, uh, in, in the context of innovation, let me restrict myself to that space at least uh, in terms of, uh, and also let's say within the space of the area that uh, you are interested in, AR and uh, augmented reality and uh, the other aspect. Um, if you want to look at an, uh, at least this is my opinion, I'm no expert in that space. My expertise is more on the hardware side. so. In any case, uh, the application, there is a world of application as I see it. Uh, I mean, the way I, I can see, this can pretty much involve all sorts of technology in the backend. Um, while the interfacing could be uh, visual 
IoT, whatever, that is just a front-end interfacing part. Yeah. But based on the problem statement at hand, it can involve all sorts of computation in the backend, um, which, which then comes to the question. So for example, it could be machine learning in the backend to do prediction, or it could be data processing, as uh, Anil mentioned before. If you are in the IoT context, you have the data to deal with, and you have to respond in near real time uh, based on the application or, or prediction. So the other example that you cited. So this, uh, so I can sort of see the whole lot of applications is part of this AR VR because uh, it is just a front ending of it, but the real solution happens in cloud in the back end where the problem is crunched out. Right. Ultimately, you have to crunch the problem out. And that problem is very hard problem or it's going to be very difficult to solve in a, re a real time sense. Okay. So if you look at the compute uh, and uh, uh, the quantum as it exists today will not be available in your mobile phone and laptop anytime soon. Uh, it's going to be deployed in cloud. Okay. Right. And it's going to be an uh, application that's running on the cloud uh, or uh, hardware available on the cloud. Then I can see a whole host of problems that say, augmented reality can go after in the back end say it requires a machine learning or a prediction or a data processing in iot and all these things um, then there is a possibility of quantum providing you that boost uh, to do that crunching number crunching that you need to do which is not an easy thing it looks um, simple enough from a distance but um, all the data set and uh, simple things like edge detection involves all sorts of matrix inversion and whatnot uh, those are all hard things to do if you want to do it non-heuristically or improve the quality of that thing. Uh, then you would have to have uh, some sort of a booster in the hardware uh, to make that happen. Um, you can't just do everything in software and hope that it will work exactly. So that's where I feel, um, I mean, AR as a field, since the context is AR, um, the whole so host of optimization, prediction, machine learning, simulation, all sorts of things can get packed in. Uh, because you, based on a particular use case, you'll be leveraging different aspects of this and uh, solving it. And that's where quantum can play a role. Of course, Shesha. So simply put, you're saying, Vishal, your vision cannot be achieved without my quantum computing backend. <laughs> or best achieved with my quantum computing backend. Yeah? Awesome. Uh, or at least start thinking about it now. Um, because I think given the evolution, it's going to... Um, uh, it's going, depending on a particular use case, it can change. As I said, different. it's likely to come through waves of application, uh, as was mentioned. Um, so you would want to start thinking about it now. And if there is any innovative things, maybe there are possibilities for startups in that space too. I understand. I look forward to that as well, uh, to achieving a vision through collaboration. Awesome. Um, so it's time for Q&A. I do have a couple of questions. If uh, people have any thoughts, please put it on the Q&A panel so that we can address it to you. Uh, while we address your questions, uh, we also wanted to give our expert advice very quickly to investors, entrepreneurs, and businesses. Uh, let me do that from an immersive technology perspective to start with. Um, investors, you don't need uh, better evidence or proof because the big five are invested into augmented reality, into immersive tech. Um, there's a scope for building a bunch of enhanced products based on this already proven technologies and enhanced products can, uh, you know, raise investments and grow in value hundredfold. Uh, there are a bunch of startups in the space globally. Uh, it's called the immersive sector in the UK and in the EU. Um, in, 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 um, uh, in, in the US, it's, it, it falls under augmented reality or mixed reality. Microsoft uses the term mixed reality, but all of them pretty much the same. I prefer to use immersive tech because it's the broadest umbrella term that covers AR, VR, MR, and a bunch of deep learning AI as well. Uh, entrepreneurs, you have the platforms ready to build your products. Um, and I think you do in the case of quantum computing as well. I'll leave it to Shesha to describe how you can create products using quantum computing. And businesses, it's high time that you take the risk and the responsibility and have the guts um, to create pilots using these technologies because they have immense value to deliver to you. Uh, if you do need a pilot, but I would reckon you jump straight into it, decide on a platform and create experiences that will basically enrich your daily essential business tasks with immersion. And basically if people are uh, better focused on their tasks, uh, you're gonna have productivity improvements and you know your world will be uh, better and more efficient. Shesha, from a quantum computing perspective. 
So I will make the case that um, quantum computing, everybody is, should be invested in that technology um, because it is a fundamentally new model of compute, but more importantly, uh, the kind of problems it can potentially solve uh, from drug discovery thing that I ex explained uh, to uh, say uh, designing better batteries um, uh, to say uh, doing fertilizers, fertilizers or uh, changing the process of how fertilizers are generated um, or logistics that Anil talked about. Um, all these, uh, the first few ones are particularly impact the society significantly and the environment significantly potentially. If you had much efficient batteries, uh, it can impact the environment quite a bit um, uh, and reduce the dependency on hydrocarbon to a large extent if, if that happens. Uh, or fertilizers, for example, uh, if you can uh, uh, do much more energy efficient way of doing it, it yeah. it's an impact on... Uh, um, the environment is quite significant. So the technology has the scope of impacting societies and countries at large. Um, uh, and the kind of problems it can tackle has a significant impact. So I think uh, as a technology, everybody should be invested in that technology and its success uh, because of its potential impact uh, going ahead. And this technology will be an important tool uh, to solve some of these world's most hard problems that uh, that we are facing, global warming and such, can potentially be addressed by some of these technological things. It can it can be used as a tool to address some of those things. So I think personally, everyone should be invested in the success of this technology. Um, secondly, in Indian context, um, there is uh, it's still evolving. The technology is still evolving, so there is also a lot of opportunity. Uh, if there is uh, for innovation. Sure. Um, and it, it is a green field at this time in terms of innovation. And so um, in terms of entrepreneurs, there should be that zeal to go uh, into a green field to see and explore. Um, and the technology, IBM, uh, I can speak for IBM, we have published roadmaps, et cetera. So things are, at least the vision statement and where we are going is clear. And at the government level, everybody is, uh, all major countries have invested billions of dollars or still investing in billions of dollars for good reasons for this technology. So across the board, the government, venture capital, and also in the personal as an investment into this technology, I think there is a broader uh, uh, understanding or clarity there. Um, and there is opportunity to go after here because it's an open green field. Uh, and I think people should leverage those. Thank you, Shesha. Um, in the interest of time, last two minutes, we'll try and quickly answer some of the questions. So uh, I have questions about immersive technology in education and prop tech. So uh, education, now the lessons have to be delivered remotely, people sitting at home. Books are hardly immersive. So an AR experience versus a book is 100 times more immersive. Learning is faster, retention is better, uh, and, just, uh, and, and your student or your children can focus on implementation rather than the learning part. So consider uh, immersion as a parallel medium. You have traditional medium of text, photo, and videos. You have immersive experiences, which is 3D, AR, VR. And immersive experiences are uh, much more enhanced and uh, deliver uh, better productivity and better learning than traditional mediums. The next question is about prop tech. So in prop tech as well, AR, VR will help visualization of property as a sitting at home or on the property itself. You can go to an empty land and see a 3D lifestyle visualization of the building. Um, and you can add, I see you asked Kiran Kumar about blockchain. So blockchain will introduce smart contracts into these experience. It's a parallel topic, but of course, AR, VR and blockchain can work together to ensure better security and better transactions and better tracking of your property transactions. You can let go of the millions of papers that we hold today. There's no other industry I've seen still relying so much on paper as prop, pro, as property technology. Uh, I hope you answered the questions. Uh, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much, uh, the panelists and the audiences. Um, uh, they are, uh, we'll try our best. You can uh, basically contact T-Hub uh, through their official channels on social media and we will respond to some of your queries and questions. You may set up, uh, contact us directly as well, request for meetings if you want to continue any of your conversations further. If you want to work with IBM and use their SDKs uh, for developing quantum 
uh, you know, developing products based on quantum technology. If you'd like to work on PTCs engines, and if you'd like to contact me regarding several applications uh, of immersive technologies in your specific fields, we're happy to connect with you. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you so you. very much uh, for, for accepting our request and be such a wonderful panel. Thank you so much. And thanks, Vishal, for, for moderating such a wonderful session. And really it's a pleasure to have you all. And uh, to all the attendees, thank you so much for joining, registering this for this session. Uh, we would appreciate to see your feedback, your honest feedback. It will appear on your screen as soon as uh, the session ends. Thank you so much. We definitely look forward to many more such sessions. Thank you. Of course. Okay.